and OSHA's involvement should be the last thing, specifically on a union job site. People should be communicating on that job site. They should feel free to be able to bring up issues forward to management. Managers should be receptive to those things and, and, and be genuine in looking into con correcting those conditions and making sure that they report back to the employees. Hello, and welcome back to the Labor's Health and Safety Fund of North America's vodcast series. My name is Ryan Paparello, the Safety and Health Specialist for the Fund. I'm also accompanied by Walter Jones, Director of Occupational Safety and Health. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're discussing what you can expect when OSHA conducts an inspection. Whenever you work in state covered by federal OSHA or one with its own state-run program, an OSHA inspector may show up at any time to inspect your job site. OSHA conducts periodic inspections as well as consultants, education, and training to protect and ensure to protect workers and ensure contractor compliance. Today we're joined by two guests. Mike McCallion, who I know very well works on A10 with me. Uh, Mike, do you want to give a little introduction of yourself? Sure. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, Mike McCullion. I'm the director of market sectors and safety for SMACNA, She Mill and Air Conditioning Contractors National Association. Uh, I've got over 35 years experience in safety and health, including 18 years at SMACNA. And as we're just talking, uh, it's a mix of construction as well as industrial architectural kind of sheet metal work. Uh, so very interested in, you know, in occupational safety, obviously. And I am uh, a former OSHA compliance officer for the state of Virginia way back in my career. Wow. So, so I've been, uh, I've been, had a number of career opportunities that have given me good ex experience, including obviously working with Bosch, Virginia Occupational Safety and Health. So looking forward to the discussion today. Great. And we're also joined by James Tui. If you want to give an introduction as well, Jim. Sure. Um, first off, thank you for having me today. It's always a pleasure to reach the folks. You know, uh, my name's Jim Tui, and I am a regional labor liaison for OSHA's Region 3 up in the northeast of uh, the country, Midwest. Um, um, I've been with OSHA since 1997. Prior to that, I was a union carpenter for 10 years. I was a compliance officer for about 10 years, followed by being an outreach representative for five years. And I've been a labor liaison for the last 10 years. Okay, so we got a, we got a good round of experience here to uh, answer these questions. So, uh, you know, one question about being out in the field, I, I know I was, I was a new safety guy one time. Um, if OSHA comes up, who enforces them to, to come on site? So I would tell you that the act is just the authority and what brings us to a site is, is several means. Uh, you know, we're, we're provided with a badge, we're, we're credentialed, there's background checks taken on us. You know, we're well-trained safety and health professionals. We're provided the compliance officers are the ones that actually go out conduct the inspections. They're preempted or, or, or generated from complaints that we receive in the office, formal complaints. We respond to referrals, could be a local fire department, it could be uh, a press agency. Uh, we respond uh, to fatalities and of course, uh, catastrophes, which a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of our time still spent on that. And then there's a program section of our uh, inspection process where your, so your industry may have been targeted because of the high rate of injury and illnesses. And in an effort, you know, with limited resources to try to reduce the, those injuries and illnesses across that, that specific industry uh, will target those industries. They're called pro-grant inspections. How do you respond to uh, imminent danger? Like if I called up and said, hey, man, there's a guy hanging out of this window here with uh, washing windows, would you go or would you call the employer first or how would that be yeah. handled? If it was deemed an imminent danger, like I'll give you a couple circumstances, you know, um, and anything in, in, in a height of over 15 feet, we could probably consider it an imminently dangerous 15 to 20 foot, depending on the conditions. Anybody working in a trench where there's no... Uh, protective measures in place, absolutely uh, an eminently dangerous situation. Uh, folks exposed to electrical live lines, working in proximity without protection, definitely these are triggered eminent danger situations. Okay. We actually drop the ball. At, I mean, not drop, drop everything we do at that point, and it does take priority. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Okay. Just, I mean, just, just one question. Say you get an imminent danger call. Is it your, I mean, do you respond back and say, you know, Hey, if there's a trench, if they're in a trench, get them out of the trench or not even shut down the site. But is there anything that you tell them to kind of guide them through before OSHA gets on site? Now, actually, we do not conduct, we do not reach out and, and, uh, and contact the employer. We, we, uh, we don't want to do that because we want to see how things are. Circum circumstances throughout the country, I can't speak to if we were in the Midwest. Some, some offices are hours, uh, half a day away from, from scenarios. In those circumstances, the area director has the discretion to contact the employer to have them removed. And, but mostly these eminent dangers are done uh, unannounced. So we're talking about OSHA improved uh, plans. I know some states have them. What is federal OSHA's uh, jurisdiction? Yeah, well, Jim, there, you know, there's the territories too. The, yeah, the, all the, 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 the states, the 50 states, but also the territories like you know, Guam and Virgin Islands. And I believe um, 28 states and territories have, are under federal jurisdiction. And then the remaining states and territories are, have their own state plans. Um, uh, which uh, most of those state plans cover private um, state and local government workplaces, but there are five states in the Virgin Islands who have the OSHA approved state plans that only cover state and local government workers only. So depending upon what state you're in, you could be visited by a federal employee if, if, you're, if it's under federal jurisdiction, or if you're in a state run OSHA plan state, you would be, you would be visited by that government or that, that state employee who would be uh, a state, for example, California um, is, is, a state, is a state plan state. So that would be the, the California uh, Labor and Industry Department that would visit you versus the federal OSHA if you were in a federal state. So um, it's important that employers know that. Uh, Jim or, or Mike, now federal OSHA and non plan state plan states, do they cover state and municipal workers? No, they do not, unfortunately. And there's been some activity on the national level to to introduce a bill that's been kind of pushed aside over the last couple of years, but would include requiring that we cover all of state and local employees. It is kind of a, a weakness, I would say, on a federal level, because those state plans do cover all employees. Uh, so therefore, uh, they are provided some funding from us. But, you know, overall, uh, if the, I'm the a subcontractor working for a municipal, let's say Syracuse, right? And I, but I'm a private employer, but I'm working for the, the government of the, the city of Syracuse. Am I still covered by OSHA or not? No, you are covered in those circumstances. If you're a contract contractor, okay. then you are an employee. In the, uh, uh, but if my employer, employer was the city of Syracuse, I wouldn't be covered. Correct. If you were right, correct. Okay. Who, who your client is doesn't have as much effect as far as as far as that. It's really or you know the kind of work you're doing. It's just it's you as a company. What is your status? Whether you're a private or you know a city-owned okay. company, it's where the ownership of the company that would that would detail who you sort of who would govern you from an OSHA perspective. I mean, that each of the states are also has a consultation mm -hmm. service. So in those circumstances or any other circumstance where an employer wants to improve. They can reach out to the state consultation services at no cost to them. There is a, a requirement that it's a smaller size company, typically under 250 employees, and, and you'll be prioritized. Uh, they will come out. They will do evaluate your safety programs out there. They'll provide training for you if you'd like. They'll try. They'll do, a, they'll do sampling for you. They'll provide any guidance. You know, all that they ask is that, once they bring these issues forward to you, that you do correct them. And, you know, they have a nuance in it that says that if they don't correct these things, that they will come to OSHA. But in the 25 years I've been in, in the agency, I've never seen uh, an employer that didn't uh, comply with the requests. They're trying to improve. That's why they reach out to these services. Did I understand you correctly? Did you say OSHA will come out and do sampling, help you with your programs, help you with your safety and health? free of charge? Correct. So that's through the consultation services. So for instance, here in Pennsylvania, that consultation service is run out of the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. So OSHA earmarks funding specifically for the consultation services. They, they are trained in the same manner that the OSHA compliance officer trains, actually 
you know, be in classes uh, at the same time at their institute. And, and yet they do not have uh, enforcement authority. So they're out there to try to assist the employer in improving the safety and health management system. That's the whole goal. If people reach out to you and, and the smaller the company, the, the quicker they'll probably try to get to you. Uh, you know, one of the things I don't know about across the country, but a, a, lot, a lot of the uh, state plans are looking for construction activity to, 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 uh, to work in. So, you know, yes, they will come out if they need to, they will, if, they, if you're requesting them to, to conduct sampling, noise sampling, or whatever that might be, uh, just to get a determination of what needs you have as far as a program assessment, they will do that uh, thoroughly, provide training if you request. And all they ask is that you, you follow up with them and, let, and, and ensure that you're implementing the changes that they've requested. That is, that is a good program. Obviously, there's a trust factor there, right? I mean, when I, you know, when you mentioned to employers, you know, to call OSHA to come to your site right over after that, you know, they get a little bit hesitant with that. So, but, but it is a very good program and, you know, um, available, you know, to everybody to do that. I would say that many employers, uh, they will turn to their insurance company or their risk control uh, departments before they would turn to OSHA, but, it, but they, because they offer the similar services, but at the same time, certainly to have OSHA, you know, come out and, and work with you. And, and you're right, they are separate from enforcement. That, that's what employers need to understand. You know, they're, you're not going to get a citation. Now you're going to have to fix what they, what they find, but hopefully that's going to improve your safety program anyway. That's the goal for employers anyway, right? If, you're, if, they're, if they're reaching out to OSHA, they want to get better. So why not have them show you what needs to be improved? I'll say OSHA was to come out in that consulting uh, situation. Is there like a opening conference or is there anything like an old like a structure of an investigation or is it just they're coming out just to just to see the site and, and, and aid from there? Well, I mean, once you contact these folks consultation, you'll set up a plan, you know, so there's no smoke and mirrors, you know, what is it that you want us to do? And they'll, they'll script out that, uh, that agenda and, and, and you'll agree upon what it is that you want to achieve on that given visit. And they'll come out and, and they'll work with you, uh, reviewing your, what you have available to you, what you have in place and, and where you may need to be. I think typically what I've seen, I don't know if you agree, Jim, but um, what I see is it's usually for a specific issue. You know, they have a specific question about, you know, fall protection or electrical safety or something. So it's usually very specific, something that they're, they're having trouble sort of deciding how to, you know, how to comply or, or whatever. So uh, very rarely would they invite them out for an entire, you know, uh, full-blown walkthrough. But, uh, but still, it's a good service. Correct. I agree. So when an ocean visit uh, actually does happen, more of an investigation, uh, what, what does a company have to do to prepare for, for one effectively? Well, I could start you off by just trying to explain what happens out there and I kind of piece that together for you, okay? So when we arrive on the job site again, we're gonna be showing our badge and then uh, we'll, be, we'll be providing to the employer and to the, to the, uh, the employer representatives you know, what the scope, the purpose, and the nature of the inspection are. So why are we there? What brought us there? What is that scope of that inspection? And what is the nature? What, what you know, why, why are we there? Okay. If it's a complaint, we will sanitize the complaint so that the employer doesn't know where the, the, uh, the complaint came from, but we'll often provide them with a copy of the complaint. Okay. So we'll open up that and, and we'll talk about like, you know, the programs, what they have in place, and, uh, you know, I ask questions like, you know, the frequency of inspections, uh, the safety and health talent on the job site, you know, who's, in, who's responsible, how is, it, how, is in for, how is safety enforced on that job site, you know, and, and circum, in a lot of circumstances, you'll have multiple trades on a job site. So you're, you may have opening conferences with several different contractors at the same time. Uh, and then again, uh, you'll explain the scope of that and, you, and the compliance officer is kind of maintained to that scope, you know. I, I believe that uh, people think that OSHA can just go out and freelance and do whatever they want. No, they have to introduce themselves. They have to explain the purpose of what they're there for and, and the nature of that visit. You know, during that time frame, we'll also explain that process. You know, we're going to be interviewing people during that process. They're, they're private interviews, you know. They can't interfere with those interviews, nor can they retaliate against anybody for one, putting in a complaint, or two, participating in the OSHA inspection process. And that's explained, you know, thoroughly before we go out onto a job site that there will be private interviews uh, conducted during that inspection. 
Yeah, that, that, that's a, that's that's a good uh, a good analogy there, Jim. Because you know, again, you have the um, the opening conference is is very important to the employer, right? That the employer should understand um, why why OSHA is there and um, and understand the the you know the the, the scope of the inspection. Uh, typically, if it is a complaint, it's usually just for one particular issue within the shop or on the job site. So the inspector would be focused on that. Um, however, the, the OSHA inspector could broaden the, the inspection if they start to find things that aren't, you know, aren't in place. You know, if they start asking these questions, do records review, because part of the opening conference is a records review, uh, or prior to the walkthrough, they could do a records review, looking at the required programs, HASCOM, um, uh, you know, uh, walk out, ta uh, lockout, tag out, the various written programs that are required. OSHA may want to look at them to make sure to see what level, like Jim had mentioned, what level of compliance is out there. And if you know if they're starting to see good things and it's just written, written programs, the answers, are, uh, the questions are getting answered properly. They'll keep it to the scope and do what they need to do. But obviously, you know, if they start to see non-compliance and you know a lot of shoulder shrugging and I don't know. Well, then maybe they would want to expand it because maybe the employer is not doing what they need to be doing. So OSHA has that authority to expand that inspection prior to um, the actual walkthrough. As far as you know, preparing for it. The best way to prepare for an OSHA inspection is to have just a good, effective safety and health program in place, right? Have have all your written programs, have all your training documented, right? Because OSHA is going to want to see the documented. Like they say, you know, it's not done until the paperwork's done. Um, and also, you know, just just do your best with with trying to identify the hazard. A hazard identification on your job sites and your shops and such is important. That's that's where you know where you need to pay, pay attention. For small employers, it gets a little bit tougher because they don't have the resources and expertise to do that. So maybe they bring in a consultant or bring in their risk control. Um, but you know, identifying those hazards, abating the hazards you, you have, doing the training and the written programs, and just preparing. Because once OSHA is there, there's not much you can do. You know, the really OSHA is there and they're there for a reason. Hey, Mike, you just said OSHA is there and there's nothing you can do. I can't kick them out? Well, that's a good point. I think one of the questions we had later on is, um, can OSHA, can you require OSHA to get a warrant? And, and again, this is a, a law, it's a law-based proceeding. So yes, you could basically turn OSHA away and say, well, you know, I'd like you to go get a warrant. I would just tell you that my experience, and Jim, you might, you might agree, when I was an OSHA inspector. If I got turned away, um, and many of my coworkers, you know, we weren't happy about it because you had to go back to your area director. You had to then file with the local judge and there's a lot of steps to go through and, you know, it's just more work than you really want to do. So you can ask them to go away and come back with a warrant, but, you know, OSHA inspectors are people too, and they're going to come back. They're going to have maybe a little chip on their shoulder, maybe a little bit more of a thorough inspection at that point. So uh, I don't recommend it. I would just say, you know, have all your ducks in a row before you have the inspection and uh, keep your fingers crossed. Mike, that was so well said. I mean, yes, I've been in that process. I mean, and, and I'll be frank with you, you know, people have that. It's their right to send us away. But, you know, I will explain to people that process that they're going to have to go through. Then when I get back to the office, you know, my, my supervisor is going to be concerned that there was a reason for you to be turned away. You know, they may, may consider that, you know, that I, I probably really need to look at this thoroughly. And it also has a lot to do with the outcome of the inspection. You know, I mean, if you're, you have programs in place that I can look at, you may have deficiencies in that program. Okay. And that may be the case, but it's not like you're, you're not doing anything, you know, communication is key on the job site, uh, communicating your safety and health program, having a certain level of calmness out there helps for everybody understanding that, you know, compliance officer might be a little nervous themselves, you know, everybody's a little bit nervous, you know, so just every take a breath. You know, if you have a good program in place, you should stand up and be proud of it. Explain, explain what it is that you do. Uh, you know how you, you you walk the walk and you and you talk the talk. You know, so uh, there's no need if you have a good safety and health program in place to be concerned about an ocean inspection. I mean, there's there's, there's one point you made. If if you're looking at a plan and there's some there might be some things that might. Not at, like not add up, but might not be updated. Like say you see MSDS compared to SDSs, is that something that you would point out, or is that something that needs to be changed on the spot? Like what? How would you deal with a situation like that? Yeah, we have to say it's situational, like you're saying. It is situational, you know. But one of the things that you can do as an employer, if I'm pointing out things to you that are clear and 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 uh, you know factual, 
you know, if you take the time to fix those things, I will note that in the case file. It's not an admission of guilt. It's simply that you're, you know, in agreeing to correct the condition, which is our goal, is to correct these conditions. You know, there's certain uh, elements of that with the conditions that I can actually have. If there was a citation issue, you could reduce the, this, the, uh, the penalty amount of that citation right out of the gate just because you're fixing it. Plus, it shows that you have good faith. You know, good faith goes a long way. And that's that relationship, that communication that you're having with, with, with the, uh, the compliance officer. What is your posture? Are you trying to... Uh, are you trying to work with the compliance officer to fix things? It looks better when I go back to the office because I don't issue the citations. I am a fact finder. I just go out, collect my facts, and bring them back, put together a report, submit that to my supervisor. If I can show that through you having programs in place, that you were cooperative during the inspection, that you were willing to correct conditions that were brought up, I'm certainly going to point that out to my supervisor, and they will take that in consideration if indeed a penalty is issued. We focus on what we call the focus four hazards, and that's falls, electrical, getting struck by or crushed, caught between. So really, that's what we're focusing on. But if we go into your site and you have an effective safety and health program, you have, uh, you know, we, you can talk the talk that you have the programs in place, that you're, you're doing inspections, that you're correcting conditions, that you're documenting these inspections that if i'm talking to the people and they're telling me that yeah if i bring these issues up to the management they correct them osha can actually the compliance officer has the right to actually reduce the scope of that inspection just down to those focus four hazards and, and, a, and a, that's a good point jim and, and the big thing one of the ways you get around you know with the with the employee uh, interviews and that's where the training is so important right we talk about training training your workers on osha you know regulations and such but it gets down to the understanding. Do they understand why they wear that harness? Do they understand why, you, why you're supposed to you know, climb that ladder a certain way? Because that's the kind of answer that OSHA is going to want to hear, right? They're going to want to hear that your employees know what's going on safety-wise and understand the hazards that they're up against, right? So if there's any kind of, I use the term ignorance, but there's any kind of you know, bad training evident, you know, OSHA would find that in, in the interview process because they're, they're, they're going to ask these questions. And if the employees aren't properly trained, it could be fairly evident that, that the training program, you know, could need, you need some work. Now, a couple other nuances. This is talking about the walk around inspection, right? So we have to we have that opening conference. We're going to gather the troops together, so to speak. So you're going to be invited. You'll have your employer representatives will, will participate. The employee representatives will also participate. Again, we're explaining that we have rights to, to conduct the inspection, that we'll be taking pictures, we'll be asking for, you know, blueprints, uh, you know, processes, we'll be asking for uh, training records. And then uh, when I'm interviewing someone, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a prop, right? I may be just out there asking you, hey, were you provided training? You know, hey, what is it that you're doing today? Who would, who would you go to if you had a safety hazard? How would you get that corrected? You know, the one thing that's the strength of, of, of organized labor is the fact that you have built in protections, right, to, to, to assist you in, in the work process. But you also have people on the job site that can speak on your behalf if you don't feel comfortable. So I would say to you, who can you go to? Can you go to your steward? Can your steward get things addressed? Do you, can you go to your business agent? Can you go to the safety director for the company, you know, to get things, conditions corrected? You know, the inspection and OSHA's involvement should be the last thing, specifically on a union job site. People should be communicating on that job site. They should feel free to be able to bring up issues forward to management. Managers should be receptive to those things and, and, and be genuine in looking into con correcting those conditions and making sure that they report back to the employees on the status of things that take long term to debate, you know, but people, the employees want to see if there's conditions that are dangerous out there that they're being addressed. Jim just mentioned when the OSHA's there, they're going to take pictures and do, you know, um, do their evidence gathering. Um, we, we tell, we're certainly with employers, you want to protect yourself. And, you know, if OSHA takes a photo, you should also take the same yeah. photo, right? And, and Jim talked about, you know, written programs. You don't give them, they can look at them on the, uh, during the walk around, but you don't want to give them copies, right? Because uh, this is, again, this is a law-based a law a law uh, process. 
So if indeed, you know, OSHA wants to, they can come back for discovery and ask for the, you know, written programs, if indeed, if it gets that far. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's, it's a process that, uh, that you want to, that the employer needs to protect themselves too. They're, they have liability with it, with the whole process. But again, it's about preparation, training, hey, preparation, and having good effective program. Hey, Mike, you just said something I did not know. So if OSHA asks for your program, they can only review it on the premises. They can't take it. They're not supposed so, to be able to take it. Jim can correct me, but uh, you know you can show them now certain things. You know, you can if you want to give them a copy. Let's say your Hascom written program, that would be one thing. But um, you know, copies of um, uh, training, training records, tra yeah, training records and, and attendance things like that. You might you might want to be careful be, be of that kind of stuff, just because. Okay. You, well, and the big thing about that is. You want to know who's who's giving what, right? What what paperwork is going out out of the building? Because you know it might be something that again the supervisor would say, oh yeah, here's this and that. Well, that that was not even the actual training record from the day, right? So you want to be able to to be sure that the, the records that you're giving are the appropriate, up to date, current current records. So that's why you know if indeed there's a, a written program comes into question then the employer should really review it and make sure that, that it's the proper paperwork before giving it to, to OSHA. Good answer. I, I, w I would also elaborate a little bit more on that though. Uh, uh, well, you know, if, if there's a requirement by the standard that there's a certification, if there's a requirement for documentation of training, then we can request that, you know, uh, certainly, you know, uh, I may end up making a list of of things that I'm going to request typically on a job site is what hell are we conducted? Uh, I would say, look, I need the following. I need a copy of your fall protection program. I need a copy of the certification for the following people for the training on, on scaffolding. I want to know the training uh, background on the person that was the competent person for say fall protection on that job site. You know, if there was deficiencies, you know, uh, if there's, documents that are maintained or required by a standard, then I have every right to oh, request really? them. I have the under the Secretary's Act, yes. Well, let me dig in, Jim. Um, okay. So let's just look at the silica rule, right? You gotta have written program, you gotta have training, you gotta have, if you're not doing table one, you gotta have uh, sampling, sampling to, right. to verify your procedures. Uh, and then you got the medical surveillance that probably is already kicking in now because we're what five years out from the standard you can you can request all of that i can now if it's a medical record then i'm probably going to have to get a medical access order you know in order to and in, in order to get that information and then the release from the employee you know uh, but any sampling information is taken on the job site, not as only available to me, but it's also available to, to the union representation on that yeah. job site. Yeah. So if they go out and somebody's doing asbestos sampling on that job site, the employees have a right to that information at any time. They can request it and they're required to be provided that information. Speaking of the process of, of OSHA coming on site, uh, you know, what do contractors uh, expect for time frame? I mean, is OSHA there for a day or two? Or are they on there for a month? <laughs> That's a loaded uh, so, question. <laughs> so, so you know, a lot of it has to do with with the 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 just the size of the the uh, the site or the company that you're inspecting. It might be you know just the number of of, of uh, allegations being made in the complaint. I will tell you, construction inspection. Typically, it's going to be just a day or two, you know, not that, not that it can't expand beyond that. But, you know, if you say you have a fatality or you have a catastrophe on a job site, OSHA might be there for some time. OSHA has six months from the time that they open up the inspection in order to issue a citation. I mean, so that's the, the wide end of it. And when we're in some process safety facilities or we're doing an inspection and refinery, we may take all six months of that to, to uh, issue the, the, the citations. But uh, typically on a construction site, and it's a one or two item situation, um, I would tell you usually there for one, maybe two days, uh, maybe one day to, to do your measurements, investigations, maybe a second day to do your interviews. But, you know, they can spend up to six months, uh, but I would say typically it's just a day or two. Mike? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good point. One of the questions I asked, I, I sort of added in, is what's the difference between an inspection and an investigation? So, and I always tell my, I always tell my, you know, any employer I talk to, I said, would you rather have an OSHA inspection 
or an OSHA investigation? Because the investigation is probably going to take longer because they're, they're looking up maybe a fatality or a serious injury. So there's a lot more evidence gathering, a lot more people to talk to, a lot more that they want to go through to make sure they do a thorough job versus a, re a regular inspection. If, the ins if they're out there to do a programmed inspection, like Jim says, you know, they're, they're there, that everything is fine. They're, they're gone in a day or two. All right. I, uh, I just want to follow up really quick and then maybe we should begin to think about wrapping this up shortly. We're about 10 minutes out. Um, how do, how do, you know, you go to a construction work site and you see a lot going on, but then you see chemical exposures that may require further, I guess, investigation um, in terms of sampling. Do you pull out your, go to your car, pull out your equipment and go to work or how does that all work? I will. Jim? There's, there's what we call super co shows, which are basically they cross over from, from industrial hygiene to, to safety. Uh, typically, we have specialists. You know, there's, there's either a safety uh, compliance officer or an industrial hygiene officer. Some can do both. Uh, but what will happen typically is they'll address the safety issues that they're there for. If they see these long-term exposures where they may have to monitor, what they'll do is they'll go back to the office and they'll make a referral to either the IH or to the supervisor will send an IH to follow up on those specific issues uh, or they'll handle them themselves. Let's, let's move on to, because uh, I don't want to hold you guys up much longer, um, to citations. When you issue a citation, uh, how does that work? And can I contest it? And is it really a lot of money? Well, I can tell you. So there's a couple of questions in there. So what yeah, will happen is... <laughs> So when the inspection's closed, right? So I'm having a closing conference with you. I'll submit what my findings are. I'll make my recommendations as to whether I think citations should be issued to carry penalties. Not all citations carry penalties. If there's what we consider to be an other than serious violation, they sometimes do not carry penalties, but you still have to correct the condition. When I say other than serious, you may have, say you have a folder full of your MSDS sheets and you're missing two, just by chance you're missing two. Right. That may be it's a violation of the act, but is anybody harmed? I'm going to find out. Does people know what the hazards are, how to react to the when the reactions of the camel, how, how to properly protect themselves? They know all that. But they don't have a, a piece of paper that may be considered another than serious violation. If you get into the serious violations, they were frozen for a long time. For most of my career as a compliance officer, they were simply put, they were $5,000 would be the top for a serious violation, $50,000 for for uh, for a willful violation, and uh, a, a proportionate uh, violation for uh, repeat violations. You get into a repeat if there's been a, a standard that's been violated by the company within the last five years that has been sustained, you can get an additional penalty for that as well. You know, the penalties were frozen to 5,000 uh, a couple of years back. The, the Congress made a, 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 a decision to bring this, the, the penalties up more to speed. So it's changed on an annual basis to predicated on, on, on uh, the, uh, the industry. I don't know the exact term with it, but the keeping up with the time. So what was before a $5,000 penalty, say 10 years ago, is now a $13,000 penalty. Uh, what was a $50,000 penalty for a willful violation is now a $130,000 penalty. So the penalty is had willful mean? What does willful mean? Willful means that you, you've done something intentionally. Like you knew what the law was. Uh, you knew that the people were exposed to the hazard and, and you, you either had either through plain indifference or intentional disregard, you put somebody into harm's way. So willful is when, you know, uh, you go to a job site and they're doing steel erection on, on this particular job site and nobody's tied off. Uh, they're not protected from fall protection. And I say to the, to the foreman, what's going on out here? And he says, I know exactly what you're saying. You mean, you mean, you know, the job where we're in compliance with the, the regulation. We do that on other jobs, but we don't do them now here because there's nobody around to watch us. That's, Willful. Yeah. That's knowing the standard. That's knowing that people are exposed at a hazard, and everybody knows that you can get killed by falls, and you're totally disregarding the the the, uh, the situation. Hey Jim, one, one thing Walter that I feel like I need to bring up is at the end of the at the end of the uh, inspection process, what will happen is a citation is issued. It'll be mailed to the employer, certified mail. 
mail will also go to a copy of those citations will also go to the union. Okay. At that point, there's 15 working days. The employer has an opportunity to set up what we call an informal conference. And it is just that. If they decide to do that, what they're doing is they're meeting with the with OSHA's meeting with the employer. If there's a notification that that's going to happen, then the union is also invited to that discussion. And what it is, it's just what it says. It's an informal discussion. The employer has the right to come in, discuss the inspection without admitting any fault. But if they just want to find out a little more information about what they're being cited for, uh, how they could get things abated, corrected, uh, time frame that they may need to get things uh, tightened up. They also have that opportunity to ask for a reduction in penalty. It's always a very beneficial situation. And for the union to participate, they, they should be there at every, every single informal that's held. Because what will happen sometimes, you may not believe this, but what will happen sometimes is an employee will tell me that, you know, they weren't, they weren't, uh, they weren't trained and then the employer will show up with a record showing that they're trained. The, the, the union could weigh in. What was that training? Also, the union can assist in the abatement process and also setting duration for the time frame. They could discuss on the time frame for something they could correct. Some things take a little more time than others. Can the union uh, get a fine, a citation or a, a increased or decreased? They can, they can show or they can at least explain to the area director that this is a good contractor that that's willing to in the past has been willing to work with us and get things corrected you know we don't disagree if you take if you take some of that penalty off of there if they're willing to take some of that money and put it towards this abatement or long-term abatement we certainly listen to because it's everybody's responsibility for safety and that that starts with the the, the management but you know the employees hold certain levels of responsibility too. So I've seen that on, on, on multiple occasions. Thank you. Ryan? Well, I think uh, we could wrap this up. I think this was a great discussion. Um, I learned a lot, especially about the OSHA safety consultants coming on site. Uh, I, you know, with, with our OSHA cons um, inspection that I had a year, years ago, that might would have helped, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't come out. But, uh, but it's good to know, uh, it, you know, beforehand. So, um, I'd like to thank Walter, uh, Mike, and Jim for joining us today. Uh, you know, um, you know, you can also follow up with the fund on our all major, major uh, social platforms to see this video and others, especially with safety and health promotion. Um, but I thank uh, our viewers again, and uh, stay safe out there.